Thank you very much, Susie. A warm welcome to all watching here at home in the UK, but also across the globe, especially to our friends in Afghanistan. Um, just quickly before I introduce the topic, I'm just gonna run through um, how this event will run. So we'll first hear from our panel of esteemed speakers. I'll introduce them each before they speak and then open up to questions from the room. Um, some have already been pre-submitted as Susie said, but, all, but you're more than welcome to put your questions into the chat box. Um, and after the questions, we'll have our final thoughts from our speakers and close this session of the event. Um, so when thinking about today's discussion, um, the Afghan peace process, opportunities for the United Kingdom and how the role of British demining can support these efforts, I was reminded of an unlikely friendship that I struck with the former foreign minister of the Taliban government, Malal Mutawakil. The first time I met him was in the warm summer of 2014. Standing nervously outside Mullah Mutawakil's home in Kabul, I was really worried about how he would react to me, a young British Afghan woman, um, and so I pulled my scarf a little tighter around my head. I wondered if he would think it was strange that I was trying to seek a dialogue with him. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, I was trying to understand how we make peace with the Taliban on a personal level. What I found in that conversation with him on that day in 2014 was very human. Malam Mutawakil taught me that reconciliation was going to be very difficult, but it was possible. I found him to be thoughtful and kind, answering all my questions about why he left the Taliban, why he accepted the Afghan constitution, and what his hopes were for peace. What struck me most was the clarity in which he spoke, telling me very clearly that the Afghan government was wasting its time trying to pipe find peace through Pakistan, a position that is very different to the one we find ourselves in today with the international community rallying around the Afghan government to try and push peace through. In Doha, we are currently witness to men in turbans and men in suits, accompanied by only three Afghan women, trying to negotiate a direct peace deal with the Afghan government and the Taliban for the first time since 2001. These peace talks are crucial if the Afghan people are to see a halt to the current indiscriminate violence being inflicted on them. It is reported that 90 Afghan soldiers are killed in one day's fighting. That's 90 Afghan families left without their husbands or brothers, 90 Afghan widows, 90 Afghan children left without a father or a brother. This loss of life is no different on the Taliban side. We sit here today, and yet al Gandab district in Kandahar province is under attack by the Taliban with people running for their lives. The urgency in which these peace talks operate cannot be pressed on us further. These peace talks were brought on about by the United States and the Taliban signing an agreement in February 2020, which excluded the Afghan government, but agreed to them releasing 5,000 Taliban prisoners and the US withdrawing all US troops in May 2021. The question for us now is the opportunities for the United Kingdom to support and achieve peace and reconciliation. The British Conservative government has pushed a global Britain agenda, one that speaks about a confident, open and outward looking UK which is sometimes in direct contrast to our current relationship with our European allies since Brexit. Ideally, the UK should be pushing for a long lasting ceasefire as a first, using our relationship with Pakistan as the sponsors of the Taliban to our advantage and allowing the Afghan government and the Taliban the space to come to an agreement. The UK has for most of its part, focused its efforts on investing in girls' education, the training of the Afghan national security forces, and as we see through the work of the Halo Trust, supporting efforts for demining by working with ex-combatants. Yet this all might be at risk. Only yesterday, we heard reports in the press that British ambassadors have been told to cut their aid spending by 50 to 70% within the next few weeks, an impact that may have dire consequences for our efforts, not only in Afghanistan, but across the globe. If we are to keep Britain global, we cannot be seen to be retreating from our international responsibilities. The Afghan people are looking to the United Kingdom to stand with them in the pursuit of peace and reconciliation, but they are not waiting for us. Every day we see Afghans continuing to live in the hope that there will be an end to the conflict. My hope lies in them, in the Afghan grandmother who lost only her, her only three sons to the war, yet gets up every day to find a way to feed her grandchildren. The young Afghan woman who finds the courage to walk out of her home every morning fighting for her rights, knowing that she may be assassinated. And the Afghan man who works a hard day's manual labor to provide for his family, not knowing when a bomb will go off. If they can have the ability to get up each and every day in the hope that maybe one day all of this might stop and that they can live their lives in peace. And the people of the United Kingdom, our government, our institutions, our NGOs, can also listen to Afghans and push harder to achieve peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan. So I would like you to join me today in doing just that, listening to Afghans about how we can support them.
We have an esteemed panel of Afghan and British speakers today to discuss these opportunities for the UK and how the role of demining can help us get there. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Farid Hamayun. He is an Afghan national who has been the HALO Afghanistan program manager since April 1995. He was actually HALO's first employee in 1988. He currently manages an excess of 2,500 Afghans and international staff who work all across the country, north, south, east and west. He's responsible for all of HALO Trust's operation and plays a vital role in liaison with government authorities and donor embassies. He is married with six kids. Over to you, Dr. Farid Hamoyin. Um, thank you very much, Paimana Jana, and uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. And thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, I'll be speaking on the basically on behalf of the mine action sector of the MAPA, but uh, explaining about HALO is like a showcase for the whole sector. As the largest humanitarian mine clearance organization in Afghanistan, what is our relevance and what role we can play in the peace process? So I'm going to uh, sort of touch base on a couple of, of, of points. First of, all, first of all, I would like to say the credibility of the mine action sector and the HALO Trust. We have a track record of working as humanitarian mine clearance organization for the last 30 years or so. So that's actually, that means a lot. And we conduct our operations in almost all 34 provinces of Afghanistan. The mine action program specific, I mean, HALO Trust is an Afghan run and Afghan led organization. It's a national entity. So people do trust and believe in, in, in our work. Our ability to work in conflict areas, we are uh, conducting mine clearance operations in the government control areas, in the Taliban control areas, in contested areas, and we recruit our workforce from mine impacted communities, working with all stakeholders involved in the, in the Afghan conflict. And that's the key point for us, because getting community consent and access um, to hard to reach areas to deliver humanitarian mine clearance projects. The most important aspect of the mine action is provision of jobs. I mean, we are playing a, a crucial role in security and stability of communities. Of course, security is achieved through clearance of landmines, explosive remnants of war, and more recently abandoned improvised mines, but also it will provide stability to communities by provision of jobs. Now, these men of uh, fighting age, uh, unemployed men of fighting age are considered as the firewood of insurgency by the High Peace Council. That's a very important point to bear in mind uh, as we go along the uh, peace process. Ethnic diversity of Afghanistan, I mean, it's, it's a very important issue and the mine action sector um, uh, is, is a neutral uh, sector. We in Halo Trust uh, employ to over 2,300 Afghan workforce of all ethnic groups Pashtuns, Tajiks, Hazaras, and Uzbeks, and the sector is really like a melting pot for all, um, you know, uh, Afghan ethnic groups. Um, our previous involvement in Afghanistan Peace and Reintegration Program. Now, in 2011-2012, the HALO Trust was working with the Afghanistan High Peace Council, uh, and we were conducting a project called the um, APRP, Afghanistan Peace and Reintegration Program. We recruited over 260 former Taliban and Hezb Islami fighters, and we provided them with dignified job. And most of these men are still are still with Halo. Uh, diversity and partnership with other organizations. This is something that uh, is quite unique about uh, the mine action sector. We, as the Halo Trust, we partner with victim assistance organizations, with other organizations involved in the livelihood and development activities, and we are outreaching more and more Afghan communities. And finally, I would say that the, the sector, the mine action sector, and specifically Halo Trust, can play a crucial role in the aftermath of any peace agreement between the government and the Taliban because we can provide dignified jobs for to thousands of uh, Afghans uh, who, in the Taliban who will be demobilized or other fighters. Because I've got only two minutes, so uh, um, you know, I, can, I will stop here uh, and leave the floor to you. Thank you. Um, and as Dr. Farid was talking about in terms of including diversity um, in these discussions, um, I'm now going to move on to um, our next speaker, who is um, uh, Rahila Siddiqui. She's the founder and director of the Farhunda Trust um, and a, a women's rights activist. She's been a senior advisor to different government agencies and international bodies, including um, DFID, USAID, Oxfam, 
um, and she has an MA in social development and sustainable livelihoods. Um, and now she runs the Farhunda Trust um, full time and continues to work with civil society organizations in Afghanistan. So Rahila John, I hand over to you. Thank you, Pemola uh, John. Thank you for invitations. And it's a privilege to be among all of you. Why, why is peace important for Afghanistan? I believe that America's endless war should end for everyone, including Afghanistan. 50 years of constant crisis has destroyed the social fabric of the countries. In addition to death, bloodshed, displacement, brain drain, and uh, Afghans have lacked economic opportunities and access to health care and education and have been unable to realize their full human rights. So first, I would like to provide some fact and figure. Based, based on uh, our AWNG search in October 2000, October 2020, there are 4 million 2,700 legal and illegal weapons in Afghanistan. Women's lives are greatly affected by this reality. Men with guns prevent them from going to school and university, and they are, have fair to uh, talk about their uh, human rights uh, because they, they think that there will be a gunshot, uh, they face gunshot violence. Same research indicates that 30% of women have been warned by men with guns to stopping uh, them from going to school and university. And over 90% of women who have gun in their household, they, have, they are frightened to speak about their human rights. Second, Afghanistan have seven to, about seven to eight million landmines uh, in the country. The result is disability with those orphans and uh, et cetera, et cetera, trauma, et cetera. So the mining is another important factor of Afghanistan peace and stability. Third, the war in Afghanistan has been bad for all civilians, but women have been affected seriously by war and they have faced high level of uh, inequality, gender-based violence, and other attack on their human rights. So what do Afghan women and citizens uh, want as an outcome from the peace talks? First, the peace talks, the, the peace process itself and any resulting agreement must be built upon a foundation of justice, inclusivity, and transparency, if it is going to be sustainable. To build this foundation, the root cause of the violence and instability must be examined and addressed. In addition, a detailed implementation mechanism should be worked out before signing the agreement. However, we, the civil society uh, women, have been hopefully have been better organized, at least at the level of advocacy, and release letters from multiple angles to different influential addresses, such as world leader, women leaders, leaders of regional and Islamic countries, in addition to writing of uh, articles, posts, organizing uh, interviews, roundtables, meeting the civil and uh, political activists of the regional countries, and also organized pan panels around the uh, diaspora um, at EU and US level. And there are some of the key points that we are collectively raising. First, Afghanistan constitution should be base for peace negotiation, as it is the voice of the people. People concerned should clearly translate the in peace agreement with no ambiguity. 50% of the peace agreement has been failed. Only 13 of them, which has woman signatory, have uh, been sustainable. The realization and institutionalizations of the right of the war victims of both sides should be addressed. We must view the Afghanistan peace as an agreement for, by, and with the Afghan people. They should be fully engaged and approve it. But it is almost, uh, it's also must address the external dynamics, including the regional countries' interest and Afghanistan international allies, such as UK, EU, and US. Second, women's political, legal, social, economic, and educational rights, along with their rights to live free from all form of violence, must be in the condition of all international aid. 
Third, the reintegration of Taliban should be sought out carefully for sustainable peace, peace building, such as formation of united government, disarmament, and security sector reform. Any new government formed should be based on Afghanistan constitutions and the practice of democracy. Afghan wants peace with dignity through strengthening democracy, employment opportunity for underprivileged citizens, women's youth, and minority in particular. Afghan citizens do not want a rushed political agreement that ultimately result the collapse of the country. Therefore, our UK uh, support has Afghanistan strong allies of development process for sustainable peace, for sustainable and positive peace building is significant. But to get the peace process on track, the first things that must happen is an immediate and comprehensive ceasefire by all parties during the peace talks. Tolerance and deep analysis of the situation for complete ceasefire should be part of the layout of Afghanistan peace building strategic plan with short term, mid term, and long term strategic objective and all the steps and process. Protection of rights of citizens based on Afghanistan constitution, Islamic Republic government based on Afghanistan uh, constitution is the citizen demand. Development aid must be provided, uh, must be provided to support Afghans as they build peace and security. Aid investment to software support, such as education in particular, male and female secondary and higher education is critical so that people be better organized to deal with their situation wisely and with patient. Investment on peace education and life skills training for mothers and daughters has community approach awareness raising about demining should be part of the peace building process strategic plan. And I think otherwise, investing on victims of landmine and ordinance weapons cost will be multiply high. If need be an independent UN NATO mediator to facilitate the peace negotiator or perhaps Afghanistan Afghans independent peace council. Investment on returnees and displacement is a huge need to give them home. There are 4 million, uh, over 5 million, about 5 million, sorry, of returnees and about 9 million of displacement. Prevention and mitigation of return back to war needs to be looked out, looked out. At present, 20 insurgents are living in, Af are in Afghanistan. There, the security force needs to be uh, strengthening because they are replacing, replacing the 150,000 of the international coalitions and they will not only save Afghans but also the region and the Afghanistan international allies. And finally, Afghan diaspora around the world should be proactively engaged in peace building uh, uh, process and UK and uh, host countries and the United Nations should play a proactive role for their engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahula John. Um, your remarks remind us, you know, for peace talks to be successful, there needs to be a comprehensive ceasefire, with justice and reconciliation a key part of any talks uh, with Afghan women at the centre. And you did talk a little bit about what Afghan people expect from the UK. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Tom Tujan, MP, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He is the current member of parliament for Tombridge and Morling. Um, re-elected in 2019. He worked as a journalist in uh, Beirut for a while um, and also served in the territorial army both in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq before becoming military assistant to the chief of defense staff. Um, he's read theology at Bristol University and worked in homeless shelters at St. Paul's um, and he also has a master's degree in Islamics, Islamics at Cambridge University and I believe he also speaks Arabic too. Um, so over to you, Tom, to hear what your views are on how the UK um, can respond to some of the things that Rahula John mentioned. Very John. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that uh, very complete CV. Um, I spent uh, four very uh, happy years as well in uh, Afghanistan. I had the great privilege of helping set up the National Security Council uh, of Afghanistan under Dr. Zalmay Rasul, uh, and then spent three years in Helmand. 
which uh, was a huge privilege working with some fantastic people. This is a this is a very difficult time uh, for Afghanistan, and uh, I, I heard uh, with great interest the comments of the first two speakers because, of course, what we're looking at at the moment is a moment of potentially of great hope, but also of great uh, tension, because the peace talks that have been engaged in since, well, not just since February, but uh, but that were signed in February with between. Uh, Zalmay Khalizad and uh, members of the Taliban raise some great hopes, but also raise some very serious questions. If you look at uh, the release of prisoners, for example, most of them went back to the front line. They didn't go to farm or to business. If you look at uh, the assassinations that are going on in the country right now, they are uh, quite deliberately targeting not just government officials, but also civil society. We're not seeing a Taliban that is seriously talking about peace. We're seeing a Taliban that is quite seriously talking about war and about victory. And when we hear Mullah Mutawakkil speak today, we don't hear the same person, I'm afraid, who met you all those years ago. This raises some important questions for the United Kingdom because the reality is we're not going to return as a military power. And I think uh, that is not only right for Britain, but actually right for Afghanistan as well. I think what we need to see is we need to see support to the Afghan uh, civilian uh, government and to its uh, ability to support uh, itself. That means support to the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, the National Police, of course, and the, to Ordu Emili, the National Army, who have done so much to defend the Afghan people in recent years and taken on so many of the responsibilities uh, that were once uh, held by others. Now, I think this is uh, an important moment for us to uh, make clear our political support for Afghanistan and to make sure that we continue to enable uh, the lawful government of uh, uh, Reis uh, Ghani to continue to exercise power, not just in the cities and on the roads, which is currently where uh, his control leads, but actually to exercise the ability to influence uh, those in rural areas who sadly so often fall sway to uh, the Taliban. So I was very interested to hear Farid uh, speaking about uh, the economic opportunities that he has been speaking about in Lugar and of course in many other places. Uh, because if we are going to have a success in Afghanistan, if we're going to see the country become what it should be, uh, which is uh, the heart of uh, a, a powerful Central Asian cultural and economic uh, growth zone, then I hope very much that we'll see the government in Kabul uh, strengthen. Now that means standing with uh, President Ghani and not abandoning the government now. Thank you very much, Tom, for those remarks. I think it's very important that we don't abandon the Afghan government. Um, I'm now going to open to questions and would like to take advantage of my position as chair. Um, to call on HALO's CEO, uh, Major General James Cohen, um, who himself is a former commander in Afghanistan. Um, I'm going to uh, put these two questions together to you. Uh, Major General James Cohen, what are your reflections on ensuring a peace that lasts? And secondly, um, I have a question here from Mr. Dominic Nichols, Defence and Security Editor at The Telegraph, who asks, how does the HALO Trust stop itself being used as a political tool by the many interested parties, both inside Afghanistan and around the region? Uh, and internationally. Well, th thanks, Peymana. Um, what can I possibly add to such eloquent Afghans speaking from the heart about their own country, or indeed to uh, someone who understands the geostrategic issues as well as Tom? I think what I have is uh, a strange experience in a sense. I, I was a former army officer. Uh, I commanded the British Army in Helmand province, and now I'm running an NGO. And I reflect that I think three big things have happened in, in, in the last 20 years. 9-11, and I first visited Kabul in the spring of 2002, when it still appeared to me to be pretty much a medieval city. And the second big event uh, is the financial crash. And the third event is what we're going through now in COVID. And the first uh, decade of uh, really um, started by that first event, 9-11, led to a decade of irresponsible intervention. But what followed it, after the crash was a decade of irresponsible isolation. What I think we should be trying to do is find a middle course between those two extremes. And what I really look for from the British government 
is a new approach to tackling this problem that is not heavy handed, is not expensive, is not boots on the ground, but uses the many very talented, very experienced uh, resources available to us. And I do believe that my own charity is one such example to achieve the kind of effect that we need in Afghanistan. And I believe that we need to come up with a new approach to this. Now, my sector, the mine action sector, has dealt very effectively with 80% of the Soviet landmines from that era. And it's pivoted now into the improvised uh, explosive device, the IED. It's dealing with small arms. It's dealing with weapon stocks. It's destroying over 80 tons of ammunition a month in Afghanistan. It's having an extraordinary effect and it's relevant to the present problem, not the old one. So I want to, in a sense, reinvent my charity, not as a mine action charity, but as one that acts on conflict. Action on conflict is something that I think should be coming out of what the British are doing. And I don't think that's a political thing. I think it is something that has a, an effect that transcends the various tribes that we talk about. This isn't about a purely humanitarian effect. It's not purely about a purely military one or a diplomatic one. I want to get beyond that to doing something that's genuinely integrated. And that I think is the trick that we should be pulling off. So in terms of the second question, how do we avoid being politicized? Well, my charity is impartial, it's neutral. It acts for the people of Afghanistan. It's not working for the Taliban and it's not working uh, for the government of Afghanistan or indeed for the British government. It is working for the people of Afghanistan and it therefore has high trust amongst those people. That's why we're called the Halo Trust after all. So that's what we want to do. And I believe that by getting rid of ordinance of whatever sort, we can create jobs in the short term and we could be an employer of literally thousands of former fighters. And we give them a disciplined, respectful, trustworthy job for the future. But then more importantly, we create sustainable livelihoods because on that land that was previously contaminated, farming can start and industry can grow. So those are the things I think we should be focusing on. And indeed our scale, when we are threatened, allows us simply to move. We can simply pick up sticks and move to a different part of Afghanistan. We do so regularly whenever we're threatened. So we do maintain that impartiality. And I would like to see the British in particular begin to think about the tools at their disposal more as part of the forthcoming integrated review and act on conflict. I'll stop there. Thank you very much um, for that. I think it leads nicely onto the next question. Um, Lord Campbell, who is actually was supposed to be attending, but he has had to pull out. Um, he's put a question through to Tom. Um, how should the anticipated new UK strategy on diplomacy, defence, security and development be set up to address conflict? Well, I think that's an excellent question, and I'm, I'm sorry he isn't here to engage in a wider conversation on it, because I'm sure he would contribute uh, greatly. Um, this is one of the things I've been calling for since I took over the chairmanship of the Foreign Affairs Committee in 2017, and indeed in a speech to Rusi, which I'm sure you've all got seared on your memory. Uh, no, sorry, you must have much better things to do than that. Um, you will have, uh, some of you will know that I've spoken about an integrated foreign policy, and what I mean by that is linking together so many things. Now, I learned this uh, when I was privileged to be the advisor uh, to the late governor of Helmand, who was a, a wonderful man and a dear friend. And he taught me so much about governance and about uh, international cooperation that I think that we could learn here in the United Kingdom. Because the reality is that the contribution that we should make here from London uh, to the Afghan people is not actually just money or just arms or just diplomatic outreach, but actually it's much more to do with uh, engaging at every other level as well, ensuring that education is successful, that uh, what James is doing uh, through the Halo Trust is successful, uh, what Farid is doing through uh, the employment locally is successful, but also to make sure that we our trade policy coordinates so that when we agree uh, various forms of uh, engagement, economic engagement with neighboring states, we ensure that Afghanistan is considered part of it, that when we see uh, judicial reform uh, in the UK or indeed in contract law or indeed in international trade law, we include considerations uh, that allow countries like Afghanistan to prosper. Because the reality is that countries like Afghanistan that don't have the resources to influence the world around them can rapidly find that international organizations 
shape to affect them and leave them cut out of international trade, leave them cut out of a globalized world if we're not careful. And so actually British foreign, po foreign policy can be coordinated to do much more than it's doing and therefore build much deeper roots in Afghanistan, build real partnerships and empower the Afghan people to play their rightful role in the whole world. Thank you very much for that. I think um, that leads nicely on to the next question um, in regards to how um, uh, gender equality is essential to peace building. Um, Caroline Squires asked this question. She's a HALO ambassador. Um, I'm not sure if she's on the line and would like to ask her question herself or if she'd like for me to, to ask it. Um, I don't think she is on. Um, I think she is, I've seen her. She seen her? Is, uh... It would be good if she could ask her question. It would save me from reading it out. It might give it more of a personal touch. Um, but I can go ahead and ask it anyway. Um, she's not around, no? Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and ask this question. And um, Rahila, if you could please look at answering this. Um, evidence that gender equality is essential to, peace, uh, to building peace and security has grown sustain sustainably since UN Security Council resolution. 1325 was adopted in 2000. In fact, involving women increases the chances of longer lasting, more sustainable peace, and yet they continue to be largely left out. What steps have the speaker's organization taken to increase female participation in their work and support female involvement at the highest levels in terms of the Afghan peace process? If we could start with Rahila and then I'll move over to, to other speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pei Monajan. I think it's it's a good question. Uh, uh, at the level of civil society, we are uh, trying hard to engage women advocacy to the uh, to the government. But luckily, the present government they are trying uh, by all means to engage women in a, uh, a leadership level. It's not it's not easy. It is hard and difficult. Um, but the, the extent that we would like to see, uh, it is not there. What we are doing through our organization is to uh, create, hopefully, to build the capacity of the future leaders through uh, their higher education, through the, their capacity building in networking and leadership capacity building. So mentoring and provision of scholarship to higher education and to rural area, like we are in Helmand, we are in Kandahar, we are in Ghazni and uh, other provinces that we are uh, supporting girls to be engaged in higher education. This is the, 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 the this is the, the, I would say that they are future of Afghanistan. And what we are trying is very small, but it can be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a massive level, hopefully in the future. Uh, to have capable future, uh, female future leaders. And there are many other approaches that organizations should take uh, into considerations uh, to build the capacity of the young leaders so that we, in the future, we don't have one uh, woman around the table or two women around the table of decision-making, but more than, more than the situation that we face in this, uh, in, in our time, actually, it was very difficult time. So, this is this is our area, and also uh, I did say in terms of our coalition and civil society has a, has a coalition that we are trying to push government, push international uh, aid, and uh, uh, <laughs> from different angle to try and provide advocacy and and push that women engagement and increase should be uh, more. But also at the policy level, I would say that international organization and international aid needs to have a condition, as I said earlier in my speech that there has to be conditions for women increase in engagement in the leadership position. But education, education, education is the key for their capable engagement. Thank you very much, Rahul Ajahn. I know the UK does a lot of um, funding towards higher education initiatives in, in Afghanistan. Um, I just wanted to come to Dr. Fareed Hamayun. Um, is there any involvement of Afghan women in the work that HALO Trust does with demining? Yes, um, definitely. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, the, the issue of gender came quite late in the mine action because of the nature of the work, because mainly dealing with mines and explosive remnants of war and so on. So, I mean, we in the Halo Trust, we are actively following this uh, gender uh, e equality and, and, and we have created a, a kind of a roadmap where we can... Um, bring more women to to the mine action sector at the moment we we have a, a relatively small workforce of only 26 ladies working for the halo trust in afghanistan but we have taken a lot quite a lot of measures for example this year we trained uh, some ladies in the 
more technical aspect of the mine action, for example, non-technical survey, we will be soon uh, be training them some ex in some explosive um, ordnance disposal um, projects. Uh, also, we are uh, ad addressing the issue of gender in the mine action in, in a conflict-sensitive manner, bearing in mind the cultural sensitivities in Afghanistan. So what we have in the mine action sector is the mahram structure, so we are we are recruiting husband and wife, brother and sister, and you know a father and daughter, and we are at, like providing that opportunity for ladies to, you know, so, so they can they can come forward and, and work for us. But generally, the sector itself is working very hard to address this issue. We know that this is not enough. We we need to work harder. But th this is something that we are actively addressing, and we have this gender ro gender roadmap that we wa we want to we want to achieve certain mile, milestones, uh, uh, you know, this year and the years to come. Thank you very much, Dr. Fade. Um, it leads us nicely on to um, a next question by uh, Catherine Mulhan, who is the CEO of the organization Restit Restitution and also the director of the Conservative Friends of International Development. Um, Catherine, would you like to come on and ask your question? Sure, I had actually prepared a little introduction, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> So yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I am CEO and also an ambassador to HALO, just to, for full disclosure. So a restitution works with governments to essentially reverse illicit financial flows and return stolen patrimony. And one of the questions that we're asking ourselves in the context of, of these debates around diplomacy um, development is where do illicit financial flows, and particularly in places like Afghanistan, where you have in a sense, almost gray markets, which are displacing uh, legal markets and serious and organized crime, which could potentially displace or, or create a state capture issue. How do we unpick that problem or square that circle? And how then can that be integrated in the, in the overall discussions around diplomacy, economics, and otherwise? Because for us, at least, we see this as a serious issue. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. To the to the um, to the group. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I think I'll go to Tom first um, for an answer on that question. Tom. Thank you very much, Catherine. Look, I think that's a really important point, and uh, one of the uh, great lessons I got in the in the importance of trade being an essential part of wider policy is one of the things we did in uh, the mid two thousands was to try and get alternative crops grown in Helmand, and you won't you know this won't surprise you. Many people tried it. And USA brought in quite literally millions of tons of free grain. Well, if the food is free, I don't care how good a farmer you are, you can't compete. And so that meant that many people ended up growing poppy simply in order to survive. And this is something that has become embedded now uh, in various different uh, areas. And uh, if you look at a, a, a province like Helmand, where uh, so much of the power of the local militias came from the drugs trade, uh, you see that dealing with trade reform is absolutely vital to dealing with governance reforms and the empowerment of women. Indeed, I was very, very uh, touched to hear what Rahila was saying about uh, the way that women's uh, place in Afghan society has changed. I remember being asked by the then United States ambassador what we were doing to reopen girls' schools in Helmand. And I had to point out, uh, even Musakala, sorry, up in the north, and, uh, and I had to point out to him that there had never been a girls' school in Musakala. And therefore, I was doing nothing to reopen a girls' school. I was doing a lot to open girls' schools for the very first time. Uh, this didn't go down well. Um, but anyway, he needed to hear it. And what we're really talking about in terms of how we engage, therefore, with uh, Afghanistan is how we challenge the internal power logics that see warlordism as the only route to legitimate economic control. How do we challenge that? And we challenge it through the rule of law, we challenge it through international trade, and we challenge it through uh, the legitimacy of the lawful government. And those are the three areas that we've really got to invest in. Thank you very much, Tom. I think it's quite clear that um, the Afghan conflict does have a drug cartel problem, as President Ashraf Ghani has also spoken up, spoken about consistently. Um, I'm going to go to the next question uh, by Lindy Moyo um, from World Vision UK. I don't know if Lindy's on the call to ask her question, um, but I will ask it. 
It's uh, what are the plans for UK aid, if any, for regeneration of communities post demining activities to ensure um, these communities thrive and demining gains are not lost. Can I go to Dr. Fahid Tamayun for an answer on that? Thank you. Yes, um, we have a very good uh, example of this uh, kind of combining mine clearance and development livelihood activities. Uh, we had uh, a project funded by UK CSSF, and this was a four-year project, and which was which is finished March last year. And this was an excellent example of integrated mine clearance and development activities. So under this uh, project, which was primarily mine clearance, we have uh, signed memorandum of cooperation with uh, two other organizations, Afghan Aid and Dakar, and we have implemented 63 mine clear uh, development and livelihood and agricultural projects in the areas where in six provinces where we, we have conducted um, mine clearance uh, activities. And I think uh, it, it was it was such a good project and such a diverse project, but obviously the need for such projects is, is so great. Uh, we need to sort of expand this and make it uh, countrywide because you know the economy is is quite bad. People do not have means and tools to develop the land and uh, post mine clearance, and it's it it will be it is an issue in Afghanistan. Uh, luckily, it's been addressed uh, by some donors like you like UK like Germany. Uh, the United Nations Mine Action S uh, Services also funded a project for us, a livelihood project for us in Kandahar and Jere. But these projects are not enough. We need more integration between development and mine action activities. Thank you very much. I think we've got another one that's kind of similar, so I think I'd like to take that. Magnus from the British Embassy in Kabul. Um, would you like to come on and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Halo colleagues. I had the privilege of uh, managing the CSF program that uh, Fareed just referred to, and I, I pay tribute to Halo's work on that. Um, my question is about uh, the role of demining specifically in uh, peace processes. And I wondered if in the Afghanistan context, uh, whether the panel see mine action's role in the peace process as being as a sort of an early win to build confidence in the early stages of negotiations, um, or if they see it as being something that comes in further down the line as a confidence building measure to rebuild trust between the parties um, in the event that talks um, should happen to falter or, or break down. Um, thanks very much and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Um, I'll go to uh, General James Cohen because he's just put his hand up and then I'll come back to you, Fred. James? Yeah, thank, thank you, Magnus. And I think it's a really pertinent question. So I think that any successful um, peace negotiation has to create circumstances in which there is more to be gained from talking than fighting. And right now, those conditions don't exist for the reasons that uh, we heard earlier. What needs to be done uh, is really in two phases. There needs to be, as you've hinted at, confidence building measures that begin to create in the minds of, of uh, the parties to the conflict the thought that actually that there are things here that can work for communities. And fundamentally, what marks the Taliban out from, let's say, ISIS is that it is community based. It's about warlords, it's about people who care about their communities and want work for their young people. So, where Halo can help is by coming in and creating work where work hasn't previously existed. In fact, we offer wages that exceed those paid by the Taliban. And so, by doing that, we can build confidence. And then if you get that patchwork of confidence growing in particular conflict affected areas, then you begin to get a groundswell of support for a broader negotiation. But the second phase I think is really vital because at the end of a conflict, if you have a high level strategic uh, negotiation and agreement, but there isn't uh, any kind of ground uh, buy-in to it, then many thousands of fighters will suddenly find themselves without work and there needs to be work created for those people so they don't go back to the conflict, they don't resile. Now, there are many things you could think about. It could be road building schemes, it could be agriculture, but Mine Action happens to be one very easily put into effect project in which thousands of young people can be put into disciplined, meaningful work. The kit exists. At its peak, 12,000 people were employed in Mine Action in Afghanistan. Now there's only 4,000. Many, many thousands of bits of equipment exist, which can be put back into use. So that's where I think we should be thinking, and we need to think big about this. 
uh, and I would encourage policymakers to move away from the old ways of thinking about narrow mine action, uh, getting mines out of the ground for good towards this broader, bigger prize. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Farid, I just want you to come in on this um, because you're on the ground and, and you work with these ex-combatants. So if you could just give us your views on, on how this is a peace process, peace yeah. process building measure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I completely agree with what James just said, but I just want to add that the war in Afghanistan, I believe, is not an ideological war. It's over the control of it's over power and the control of resources in especially in the countryside. You can see that. And I think that uh, the mine action can play a, a role both in the acute stage uh, in a post-conflict situation. I can give you the example of Ghazni in 2018, which has been uh, with, for five days has been captured by the Taliban, and then they were pushed back. And there was this huge problem of unexploded ordnance with lots and lots of civilian casualties. And we were there on the ground providing assistance to other aid agencies for resettlement and for the World Food Program distributing uh, food to the IDPs, internally displaced people. So that's like in the acute sort of post-conflict situation. But as James said, it also plays a very important role in any post-conflict in the confidence building uh, and, and stabilization of, of communities. As I said in my in initial kind of discussion, uh, the High Peace Council calls these people, unemployed people, as the firewood of insurgency. For a very small amount of money, people can go and recruit these people and use them to make improvised mines and so on. So I think it's all about job creation. And I give you my own kind of example. When we go to a community to start a demining project, the competition and even sometimes like less argument between the community is not is more about how many people Halo can recruit. So we are not short of manpower. There are like hundreds and hundreds of people that they want to join mine clearance because it's considered as a neutral job. And there's this fat fatwa from the local um, uh, ta uh, imams that mine clearance uh, you know, as a neutral job rather than joining the Afghan local police force and become the Arbakis, why not working for a neutral organization uh, to uh, like Halo, like you've seen in that interview that, that uh, my friend from Logar was talking about. Thank you very much, Dr. Farid Hamayun. I think from the video, we can see the direct impacts of the work that the Halo Trust is doing in helping um, ex-combatants um, get a different type of livelihood. And we only have time for one final question um, before closing statements. So I'd like uh, Rahila John to answer this one. Um, it's from uh, Anna Shornova from Oxfam. Um, how can the UK help ensure a negative peace is avoided and a just, inclusive and sustainable peace effort is strengthened? Um, sorry, I'll get the same one. Um, uh, thank you very much, John. I think it's a good question. Um, as I said earlier in my uh, speech, uh, the positive piece uh, ne needs a lot of work. Um, it needs a lot of investment and, and very careful approach of engaging people, um, asking people to, to be the owner of their peace buildings and also has uh, rightly Dr. Farid said about the uh, job creation and, and considering the dignity of the, uh, of, the, of the people of Afghanistan and uh, the right of the minority, the right of the women, the right of the uh, 60, over 60% 60 of the youth in Afghanistan. So uh, job creation is, I would say that <laughs> And, and also consideration of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Taliban when they come, the integration has rightly, uh, James, uh, Mr. James says, uh, they, need, they need home back. They need uh, work, they need employment. They need uh, peace to be, uh, to be in peaceful in their homes. And so this integration and reconciliation with the village, the people that they are going to back and living is it needs investment. Um, and also with people who are in the village, with them to understand and to, so the process of building trust, but also creation of job and education. And other thing is the community-based education, peace education and awareness raising is key for this process. So that people understand that why why this piece is important for them, and how they want to be engaged. Thank you very much, Rahul Ajan. Um, unfortunately, we've um, lost time to 
to get more questions to the panel. Um, and so I'm going to go for um, final remarks and, and closing statements um, from our panel. I'll start with um, Dr. Freud, if I could um, get you your final thoughts. Yeah, I think that, thanks very much. I think we should carry on having these kind of discussions at you know, uh, with, with sort of with various stakeholders and may, more importantly with the, with our donors, donors of the mine action, because I think we should not, uh, uh, I think Tom pointed out a very important thing. We should, we should not forget Afghanistan. We should not ignore Afghanistan. You know, we should, Afghanistan should remain on the focus and spotlight of international community. Um, as Tom said, it's not just about money, but it's more about political support. It's to make sure that Afghanistan is not like pushed to the side like in 1990s. I think the fact that the international community, the UK, US and others are maintaining an embassy in Afghanistan and providing support to the Afghan people, I think it's psychologically it's so important for the Afghan people. And I think that there is an, a light at the end of the tunnel, inshallah. I, I believe that sooner or later there will be some kind of peace. But in the interim period, I think we need support from the international community to make sure Afghanistan is not falling back like in the 1990s with millions of refugees and, and so on. And I would say the work of organizations like the Halo Trust providing working in conflict zone, zones, I think it's extremely important that that this work needs to continue saving lives and providing jobs. Thank you very much. Um, can I go to Tom next for his final uh, remarks? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. I'm delighted uh, to have heard such fantastic uh, speakers as Dr. Farid and uh, Rahila. They've spoken beautifully and powerfully about uh, a country that has uh, really burned itself on my heart and, uh, and, and that I find very difficult to leave. So I'll just mention one more person who I think has done an awful lot for Afghanistan, and that's Hamid Galani. The Galani family in general have uh, served the country with great dignity, and the death of his father, Haji Pir Galani, uh, was a great loss for the High Peace Council, but his son has stepped in uh, very capably. And I'm reminded, actually, of, uh, of the advert that used to go around. I don't know how many of you remember. Roshan, Nazdik Shudan. And, uh, of course, the truth is that we are all Nazdik. We're all close uh, in this uh, connected world. And this uh, wonderful system here, Zoom, <laughs> is, uh, is bringing us closer still. So I think, uh, I think very, very much of the, uh, of the proximity that we have and we share, and that, sadly, 9-11 reminded of us all too clearly. But I think it's also worth remembering that that proximity can be a huge strength. If you remember that uh, in the late 1940s, uh, Afghanistan was much wealthier than South Korea, much wealthier than South Korea. And look at the path that both those countries have been on. On one side, you can say that's sad. You can say that that's a tragedy. But you can also say that it's a moment for hope and a moment for uh, optim optimism, because if you see what Seoul has become, uh, all I can say is Babur's garden is more beautiful than anything I've ever seen in Seoul. So I have a huge hope for Kabul and I have a huge hope for Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, Rahul Ajan, please, could you um, give us your closing remarks? Yes, uh, Prime Minister John, uh, I think Tom uh, beautifully stated that we don't want to uh, uh, international community, especially our UK to leave Afghanistan alone. And I would repeat my statement that UK has uh, Afghanistan strong development allies to contribute for the really positive and, and, uh, and uh, sustainable peace building in Afghanistan and can play, of course. And people need to be at the center of this peace development through their engagement through their engagement and through their approval, this peace needs to happen in Afghanistan. Thank and, you very much. And women in, not to be forgotten. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, before we before we close, um, I'd just like to get some reflections from Major General James Cohen um, as the Halo Trust CEO um, and a, a former commander uh, himself. Thank you, Pimon. I mean, I'm not sure I have a great deal to add, uh, just so, impressed by what I've heard this afternoon. Just one thought. Um, Afghanistan is not an island unto itself. It is, and it always has been, vulnerable to the, the broader geostrategic issues with which we face. And the big event uh, that has just taken place, of course, is the US election. 
and President Biden's administration coming in. I think we now have an opportunity for an administration that is experienced, that cares, uh, that wants to get do right and is not running away from the problem. And I feel this is a hugely optimistic moment. And I do very much hope that, although we're a largely Afghan British audience today, we don't forget uh, the role of America in doing the right thing in Afghanistan. And I very much hope that we will see a new policy emerge in the next few months um, that will reverse uh, the, the very uh, um, poor state of affairs in which the Americans were really walking away from this, leaving Afghanistan to itself. Um, so I am very optimistic. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all our speakers for being with us um, and for providing their closing statements. I think the thing that we've heard loud and clear is that we should not be abandoning Afghanistan um, and that the Afghan people should be at center and front stage of any peace negotiations, um, not forgetting uh, the role of Afghan women um, in these peace talks specifically. Thank you very much to everyone for being here. Thank you to the Big Tent um, a Festival for hosting as well as the Halo Trust. Um, and I very much enjoyed these discussions. I'm gonna hand back over to Susie um, now, thank you.